Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the California Historical Society. My name is Anthea Hartig, and I have the distinct honor of serving as the executive director. And I want to wish those of you who um, perhaps are not as observant um, uh, as others and think of them and hold them in our hearts as we atone for whatever you may need to atone for, um, and to enter this special season for many, many souls around uh, the world and to com contemplate the complexities of the canonization of Father Junipero Serra today. Um, California history is alive, complicated, uh, and ever challenging, I'm sure. Uh, tonight, it's truly an honor on behalf of our Board of Trustees, my incredible staff, our remarkable uh, volunteers, including we have one in the audience, and she will never forgive me for doing this, so I won't make her raise her hand, um, who has volunteered for CHS and just left our um, volunteer employee uh, for, I think, think longer than many of you have been alive. And um, it's remarkable when you have someone start volunteering in the 1970s and just finally leave you. Um, she's also an incredible donor to this organization and it's people like <coughs> Peggy um, who uh, keep us going and uh, give us strength uh, and hope for the future. Tonight is very special. We are here to welcome uh, the second volume of John King's Cityscapes, uh, lovingly and critically written, published in the Chronicle, uh, and then, as John just said to me, uh, remade into beautiful little books by our dear friends, partners, and colluders at Hay Day. And uh, Lillian Freer is here, uh, um, up serving you beverages from Heyday on behalf of Malcolm Margolin and his entire team and board. Uh, we also extend our gratitude uh, for you tonight. Uh, I have a very light load. Uh, I get to tell you two things, um, and one is short. Uh, if you buy the book tonight, so over half of you who registered are members of either CHS or Heyday, thank you so much. Uh, we rely on you as a nonprofit. And if you buy the book tonight, you get 20% off any membership category. And you don't have to do the math. That's the brilliant thing, because my staff and, and our systems will do the math for you. If you're already a member and you'd like to renew early, you can also take an additional 20% off. Or you can just give a nice early holiday gift to anyone you'd like and purchase them a membership also for 20% off in any category. My next task is a joyous one. I get to introduce my friend and uh, comrade in, in arms, John King. As you know, John is the San Francisco Chronicle's urban design critic, and his beat, which he often cruises with a dapper hat, um, covers architecture, planning, uh, and all kinds of related issues in San Francisco and the broader Bay Area. He's thought about in the incredible built environment here, the archeology, span the pain, uh, the joy that it brings, the minute intimate spaces, as well as the towering skyscrapers that are increasingly defining our urban landscape. His column, Cityscapes, as you know, helped birth these uh, books, and every Sunday brings us somewhere special uh, to an individual building. Uh, we're honored that John has joined the Chronicle. Uh, uh, he joined the Chronicle rather in 1992 and continues uh, to enliven, educate, provoke, and inspire us. This, of course, is the second book. We also have the first one. If you want to buy the double set, I don't have a promotion for that. Just buy buy them both. Um, and, uh, and we're thrilled uh, that he's here tonight to share it with you. Uh, John's won many awards uh, throughout his career. Um, and we also were able to work on a wonderful exhibition called Unbuilt San Francisco together with a number of partners a few years ago that some of you may recall seeing here. So um, without any further ado, I will introduce to you uh, a dear friend uh, and a wonderful mind and great thinker, uh, John King. <laughs> Okay, um, I realized I did everything to prepare for this except have them show me beforehand how this works. So we will find that out when it comes time to move. Um, so it's already on? 
I think I have to turn on. Anyway, I'm going to chat for a minute or two before I get to that. Okay. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank you all for being here. This is incredibly flattering. Okay. This is incredibly flattering just to have this kind of a turnout and have this kind of a turnout for a talk that, you know, in a lot of cities would be seen as something fairly rarefied or something kind of abstract. You're going to see the whole show here. Um, great. Um, but the, I also appreciate you all being here because you're guinea pigs. This is the first, the, the book just came out this month. And um, I'm going to talk real quick about it before getting to the, the formal talk. But this is the first appearance I've made in connection with the book. And it's also the first um, appearance of a talk I'll be giving when anyone actually asks me to give a talk related to the book. So I'm kind of giving you all these warnings because I think it's a real good talk, but it's probably going to be a little ragged around the edges. And, and, and it, it, after it goes through spring training, it'll be all lean and mean and fit, and I'll have the jokes all fine-tuned and things. Uh, but, but I hope you like it. And I just want to talk really quick. Um, for those of you who read me in the paper or online or whatever, um, the cityscape column began back around 2008 or so. It's been going so long, I don't even remember when it started. And I write the words and I take the photographs and they run every, pretty much every Sunday in the paper. This is the second collection of columns put into the book. And so on the one hand, there are columns being taken from, or rather the, there are like chapters being taken from the column, however, the idea with the book is to pull them into connected themes. Um, and then, so just by doing that, you end up kind of reframing the text. I mean, I rewrote everything. If you were to go back and compare what was in the paper with what is in the book, you'd find, first of all, that the book is much longer. It's like 120 words or so per building. So right there, it's, you know, I've got subplots and everything going on. Uh, but then also, it's just kind of really, not just what is the essence of this building that has kind of a moral that can be applied at large, but then also fitting it into themes. So the first book, there was uh, icons, which is an overused word, but a word that's worth thinking about. And then, you know, there was history, there was change, the landscape, notions like that. For the second book, which I'm very happy with, and I hope you buy and enjoy, um, the real obvious themes were all in the first book, so I had to get more creative. So the, the second book, one chapter is on towers, or, or one set of chapters is on towers, one is on connections, just kind of the role of buildings and structures in connecting things. One is on clues, just kind of how you can read the building for clues about the culture, the history, whatever. And then one is a section on the waterfront, how that's changing and how the kind of rules of the waterfront front apply to the city itself. But what's interesting, so with, with this talk though, I wanna kind of take those things and then apply it very much to the San Francisco of today because as we all know, and these are very strange times where the region is so prosperous and so healthy and unemployment so low and demand is so high that everyone's kind of in a bad mood. And there's fighting about gentrification and there's fighting about development. And there's this very odd tension and there's this real sense of, well, if we are going to have development, it needs to provide affordable housing. It needs to provide this, it needs to provide that. Or it should be stopped or it shouldn't go there, it should go there. And in all this, architecture can almost kind of become almost irrelevant to all the other debates. But the fact is, is that the buildings are hugely important. I mean, we're attracted to San Francisco and the Bay Area, not just because of the geographic location, which is so powerful and which is such a draw, but also the way that it's been filled in, the neighborhoods that have been built, kind of what's emerged. And those are, you know, 
that is the built environment. That's the built terrain. And so what I want to do is just kind of look at, you know, how the buildings around us, beyond the architectural style, beyond the lessons they have about, you know, kind of how building, how the city was built, how the city is being built, is almost just how buildings, some buildings, whether they're new or old, really do embody and define and reflect the San Francisco of 2015. So what I want to do is look at 10 buildings. Five will be looked at in a little bit of length. And then, or like I said, it's the first time, maybe too much length in some of them. Um, and then the second five will be much more quicker just to kind of move through because I, I think by then the main points will be self-evident. And then I want to end with questions because this is, there's no more interesting topic in the city to me than just kind of talking about what's around us and what's coming and why we got where we are. So I want to start with 10 build. The first building, I'm going to start with a very obvious one, and I'm guessing if I asked you to name it, you'd, you'd figure it out which one. And that building is the Ferry Building. And, you know, it has been a genuine landmark on the waterfront in the city, in the image of the city, since it was designed by, you know, Arthur, Arthur Page Brown? I don't know. I don't know architecture. I'm a history major. Um, you know, it, it opened in 1898, and um, A. Page Brown was the architect. It was the portal into the city until, 19, you know, until the mid-late 30s when the bridges were built. There were talks about tearing it down or just leaving the tower and tearing an else thing, uh, tearing everything down except the tower. Decades passed, and then in 2002 it reopened, and it's really been on a roll ever since. And, you know, it's a very powerful city because it captures San Francisco's love of the past, but the desire for the actual life within the familiar landscape to be very of the moment. And, you know, part of the power of the Ferry Building is the location. You know, it's the foot of Market Street, it's the edge of the bay, like I said, it was the portal. But it's not simply a relic. I mean, I work across the street from the new mint, or the old mint, which architecturally it's every bit as resonant as the ferry building, but you know, it, it's a much different story. This one, on the other hand, it's not just a relic, it's not just something for history buffs, but you know, it is a very popular space. It's a remarkable draw, and it's attracts, you know, it, it very much kind of holds up the whole idea that, you know, almost the food culture of San Francisco, that small retailers and makers tied to the land. Food is sustainable culture. Tourists come there and love it, but also Bay Area residents feel at home. And as we all know, the location, you know, cannot be beat. And, you know, once upon a time, none of this existed that we're looking at. The ferries pulled right up into the building. The bottom floor was storage. People got off the ferries and walked into the second floor and down the stairs. Now there's the public walkway, you know, kind of mandated by BCDC, the idea of access to the water, you know, with an addition of office space at the back that when you look at it, you think, oh, that's okay, it's not great. But whoever is walking around there scrutinizing the architectural details. And, you know, all of what I'm saying, this is kind of what sets it apart from Pier 39 or Ghirardelli Square. It is very much part of the city. It's not merely a destination. You know, it exerts a gravitational pull, but it's also strong enough that it can kind of take whatever the city dishes out. You know, this is a sculpture that was down south of the agriculture building for a few years. I loved it. I don't know what you folks think. Um, it was kind of an offshoot of the Burning Man Festival. And, you know, it doesn't look a whole lot like the ferry building, but the two of them get along just fine. <laughs> this is a photograph I took last week. We've got the history of the building. We've got the gestural history of the 1915, which the subliminal message is come back to the California Historical Society and look at the exhibition. You know, but then we also have this 
set of sculptures that I haven't read about anywhere and they just kind of, they're there. I don't know if they've been there two months or if they've been there two weeks. And, you know, so it's, it's a traveling exhibition about the notion of freedom of speech and self-censorship. Um, created to generate a reflection on the importance of freedom of speech and self-censorship. And, you know, it, it's kind of like, and all this is fine. The ferry building seen it all happen. The ferry building seen the boom and bust. And I think it kind of captures a facet of the city, which is no, much, how, no matter how much we're in a dither about the moment, you know, the city just, buildings like the ferry building just shrug it all off. Now the next building I want to talk about is one that purely in the abstract is very much like the ferry building. It's on Market Street. It's a large masonry structure that has been, oh I see what's wrong now, okay. That has been repurposed and everything. And I'm referring to the Western Furniture Exchange or we might know it as the Merchandise Mart at 1355 Market Street but now everybody knows it as the Twitter building. And again, the basics are this, it's, it's the same mix as the ferry building. You take the old, you fill it with the new, you devote the ground floor to shops and restaurants, kind of oriented around food. I don't, I'm kind of curious, how many of you have been into the building and looked around? Boy, you guys get out, I'm impressed. Uh, I was talking to a coworker who I convinced him to go down today to take a look at it because he was, he was kind of curious about it. Um, but on the other hand, even though it's a lot like the ferry building, it is also very much a building that captures what today San Francisco is like. And the ground floor, I just want to give you folks a real quick tour. So here's you know, on the outside, this is a shot from beforehand. This is when it was still SF Mart. So it's probably about a five-year-old shot. And the building, you know, I could show you a, a now shot, but it pretty much still looks like that. Uh, the, the rooftop additions have been changed a little bit. The openings on the ground floor have been expanded a bit to just make it connect more. Um, but then once you go inside, it's really been kind of hollowed out and you know the structural grandeur that it was kind of implicit is now made really explicit in the building. I mean, it's you know an architectural historian, it's Art Deco, but you know this was a big merchandise building. It just had enough flourishes to get by, and it didn't take much to strip that away. We will get back to the wood in a later slide. Um, you go through there, and it's kind of a food hall, like a market that is going to be replicated in other buildings in the city. Uh, it also has three large restaurants, but whereas the ones that, you know, did, so they're like the ones at the ferry building, kind of wanting to really connect you to San Francisco, but oh, I thought I cut this shot out. So right here, you're getting the, uh, you're getting the director's cut. <laughs> you know, but here, here's part of the menu from one of the restaurants, Dirty Water, and besides the, I presume, the misspelling of the word Napa, although maybe I'm just not cool enough to know it. You know, you look at this and you can tell that, well, we don't want to just be expensive. We want to be kind of cool and edgy and aren't we hip and maybe Michael Bauer will come by and enjoy us and things like that. Um, in the back, there's also a public space of sorts. It is not the waterfront though. It is Stevenson Street, one, one kind of snub end our snub-nosed uh, block of Stevenson Street has been turned into a public-private alleyway. I'm guessing more private than public, though if you go and sit there, that's okay, but who knows. You know, so there's the little uh, deck that's been added so people can sit outside. For the record, that beautiful green turf is AstroTurf, so the lack of sun's no problem and the lack of water's no problem. You'll notice, notice the visual accent uh, down toward the back. It is a fire pit because what tech-friendly building doesn't have a fire pit that you can sit by <laughs> while you check your phone? Um, though in, in defense of this guy, I was sitting on the other end discreetly taking photographs of him with my phone. So it, 
I cannot cast stones. Um, and, and so it's kind of like, well, well, why include this in the mix? If it's just the ferry building 15 years later or 13 years later, and it's because the Twitter building does show how the newest boom, the current boom in San Francisco, as much as we might want to make fun of it, it embraces a lot of the idea of San Francisco, the notion of authenticity, the idea of the physical landscape and all. But there's a real difference because there's a certain, and I don't mean this in a critical way, but there's a certain... Um, it's hard to use the word fetishistic without sounding critical. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's very expressive of being expressive of something. Um, it's very bespoke and artisanal and things like that. And for instance, this is, we're going back into the lobby, you're kind of go, looking toward, you walk in off the street and there's a little office lobby that opens into the kind of area that these things spill into. This very cool piece of art, which I forgot to bring the artist's name, it's old mailboxes from the building that were turned into kind of a three-dimensional sculpture and then accented with dichrotic glass. Um, I'm, not, I'm definitely not an artist. I mean, it's a very visually mesmerizing piece. Um, I see someone taking a picture, so I'm going to talk slow. Oh, you can take it. I just was about to click away. Uh, and then we've got the wood around it. It's recycled wood, but it's not just any recycled wood. Here's the sign that tells you the wood came from the building and all the things that were done in order to achieve code compliance and create a new roof garden. And honestly, it feels great. And I think the piece of art is super terrific. But there is, a, there is this kind of, it's not just like a little historical display in the lobby saying, here's the history of the building. It's really saying, look at this. We're, we're repurposing. We're salvaging. We're making. And the other reason that 1355 market is on the list is that it's the most, I really do think it's the most kind of emphatic cultural example we have of how technology, much of it derived from the social media and operating within the realm of the social media, is reshaping our physical landscape today. You know, these new forces are catalysts, not just driving up the price of housing or driving up the price of Axine, Axis Deer Tartar, whatever that was. <laughs> Um, see, the next time I'll have read the menu closer, so I'll, I'll, I'll drop effortlessly a name in there. Um, but also, what you've seen with this building is there were a lot of development sites around it that had been entitled for years, that had been debated for years, all the efforts to get Red Market Street going. Once Twitter came in, signed up, the building was redone, Uber moved into the building that's on the west. Dolby is just now moving into the building that's on the east. All of a sudden, you start getting buildings popping up in all directions. Um, this one is the 35-story uh, biggest tower at Nemo, which is an apartment complex of no less than 754 units. Uh, down on 9th Street, I, I apologize for the photograph. The glass building in the middle is by Avalon Bay, a age of 55 9 or something for the address. But that's 260 units. Um, that is a lot that, I mean, I've been doing this since 2001. It went through three iterations. Every time there was a boom, the developer got the site, then the boom went bust, the building went bust, bingo. As soon as Twitter was moving in, Avalon Bay, a big national apartment developer, grabbed the site, quickly slapped together a new design and started building. And then at the back of 10th and Mission Street, I wrote a column about this uh, earlier this year. <coughs> this is actually an affordable housing complex. It's condominiums for um, middle income and lower middle income buyers. It's 190 units developed by the Tenderloin Neighborhood Development Corporation. 
You know, these are all things that theoretically could have happened in the 90s or in the 2000s. They're happening now because of the most ephemeral technological innovation we've ever had, which is hashtags and it's likes on Facebook and it's contact me via LinkedIn and things. Um, you know, so it's just real fascinating. So, you know, together these are about 1,200 units. That's a lot of housing, and I'm guessing you're also thinking that's a lot of glass. Which brings us, um, we're gonna keep moving on, and it brings to the third building that to me defines the current San Francisco world. Oh, that was the slide I was supposed to show just now, my little artsy glass shot. But we'll move on beyond it. Now see if I, I'm, I take all the cityscape photographs. I'm the guy in the book. 90% um, of the shots in this lecture are mine. And sometimes I worry. I look at that and I think, wow, what a cool shot. And then I also think, oh, I'm turning into one of those photographers that just, oh, isn't this a cool shot? Um, having said that, I like this shot. But I'm going to crop it tighter next time. But it brings us to the third building, which is 560 Mission Street. And that is the one in the middle. It's not the one on the right. It's not the one on the left. Um, it's not the one, it's not 535 Mission, which is an all glass building just down the block. It's not 350 Mission, an all glass building about to open. Um, it is not any of these towers on Rencon Hill. Um, it is the, inf the infinity on the left and Lumina on the right, soon to, one open, one soon to open. It is not the towers going up as we speak on Rincon Hill joining one Rincon Hill. Um, in other words, it's a lot of glass and in certain lights you can think, you know, it doesn't look like the ferry building. It doesn't look like, it. you know, what city is this? Um, I mean, these buildings, they are playing to contemporary styles. It's the belief of developers and financiers and the architects who work for them that people with money and resources, the decision makers, whether it's to buy a nice condo on the upper floor or move my company into the new building, they want things to look as new as can be. Um, so why do I choose 560 Mission, which is the one in the middle here, that's the St. Regis. This shot is now a historical artifact because it's done before the addition to SF MoMA went up. So it's St. Regis, uh, Boda's SF MoMA, and something in the back, whatever it is, and 560 Mission in the middle. Um, that's such an interesting angle. Okay, I'm, I'm getting distracted here. Um, partly I chose it because it's the first of the kind of all glass crop. It opened in, uh, it opened in the year 20, 2002. Uh, it also, to me, is the best tower of the crop. When I, I did a wrap up in 2010 on, you know, like kind of the top buildings of the decade, and this was one of the ones I put on it. The architect was Cesar Pelli, and he has shifted his looks over the year, started out very modern, kind of embraced a corporate postmodernism, but with a real light touch. But he's always been about the details and really you know, getting things right, and the firm Pelli Clark Pelli is continuing that. And the precision of 560 Mission you know, even though it's all glass, it's not all glass. It does have the metal work. And it really does have a texture that comes to it. It works on the skyline, you know, and it works on the ground. And it's, it's interesting, uh, when I was starting out, when I've been at the Chronicle since the early 90s. Um, I was hired as a kindergarten intern and just took off from there. But, you know, I started as the critic in 2001, and this was being built, and I thought, oh my God, my God, my God, it looks terrible. It was just this big black thing. And then when the lights came on inside it, you kind of thought, oh, okay, this is what the architect was talking about, that he, he was saying one of his models was um, 
like kind of a Japanese lantern with the real delicate you know, frame around it and then the light inside. And it's interesting how it works with that, that even though it's a metal building with metal, yeah, I'm sorry, a glass building with thin metal details, even though it's totally new, it, it isn't too out of place. And the other thing, um, when I talked to Cesar Pelli about this, is he said that besides Japanese lanterns, one of his models was the Halliday Building. Um, you know, Sutter Street, Willis Polk, the, you know, the first glass curtain wall building in the United States, according to a lot of historians. You know, so there might be some hyperbole in that, but, you know, you can see a certain spark there. And also I want to real quick mention, this is a shot from, it's either from the book or it's a crop, a set I took for the book. I don't know if you folks have been down there, but it was restored about two years ago. And it's really worth visiting. It looks terrific. Um, but it's just kind of interesting because, you know, ultimately, I think this building fits as one of the defining buildings because it's kind of the definitive example of, you know, this global craze touching down on the peninsula, which is glass, modern, very clean, you know, buildings that really, they're designed for the ads that show the man or the woman standing in the corner with all the glass around them looking down on the city at night. Uh, but having said that, it also shows that international trends can look at home on, on the local scene. The next building is 184th Street. It is a 150-unit affordable housing complex, and it is in Mission Bay. And so I, I bring this into the mix partly for the building itself, partly for the district it sits within. Because I'm sure that for many of you, when you think of Mission Bay, you think of something like this. Um, or you think of something like this. You know, what you think about is the most kind of sad, fill-in-the-box product. Jam it in, get every inch you can, do the bare minimum. Wow, that just... Uh, that one, at least, we can look at the trains. Um, you know, but, but there's this, you know, Mission Bay went up. It was fought over for years. And then once it went up, everyone was like, oh my God, it's so bland and boxy. Why is it like that? And kind of the reason it is bland and boxy is that's what the planning dictated. Um, but what's interesting, if you go and you walk around, you know, south of King Street, across the creek and things, is that no matter how bland and boxy a lot of the architecture is there, it is starting to breed life. I mean, if you walk around in Mission Bay right now, you know, you see dog walkers. Um, this building, by the way, is the empty lot in the prior building. You know, so that shot that I had before was from like 2012 or something. Um, if you ever went south of Mission Creek, it was fascinating. All the roads had been laid out, all the light poles were in, all the wires were in, and it was just empty lots except for that one building. But now it's filling in. So you've got people walking their dog. You've got a scene outside Phil's Coffee, certainly on the weekend mornings, but pretty much every morning. You see there are children there, and you know, you see, and of course there are dogs there. You see multimodal transit. I mean, we've got cars, we've got trains, we've got bicycles, we've got scooters. Um, and this is actually, if you look now, he's going by 1184th Street. And it's interesting because this, the building occupies a very prominent location. Um, it is on, this is 4th Street, which is the main entrance into the south side of Mission Creek. And it's, that's where the uh, streetcar or the light rail line goes. And it is not there by chance. When the neighborhood was planned, the city and you know, determined that 30% of it was going to be affordable housing. You know, high housing prices are not a new thing in San Francisco. And 
the developer would provide the housing sites and the housing sites would be sprinkled throughout the neighborhood, including giving the affordable, marking out affordable housing for some of the best sites in the neighborhood. The Phil's uh, coffee that we saw is on the other side of this bridge. That's affordable senior housing. With the, it also holds the neighborhood's library on the ground floor. Cross down here and this very much a kind of like a gateway location is occupied by this building. And it's not just that the city, the first batch of buildings that came through Mission Bay were pretty mundane. By the time things really started going in, the city didn't just want the affordable housing, they wanted distinctive architecture and wanted something that would say this is a neighborhood with architectural ambition and things. And so, you know, the, the city set out and the, the non you know, it awarded the site to a nonprofit developer, but very much kept a watch on who would develop it or who would design it. And so the design team are two very good local architects, Mithun Solomon, which is Dan Solomon's firm, and Kinnerly Architects, Owen Kinnerly. And the building they designed is very much designed to say, you are here, you have arrived, you know, this is something going on. And they, like a lot of the Mission Bay buildings, they take a large site and they break it up into smaller pieces. But here though, it's not just kind of set the bay back a few feet and paint it pale green instead of vivid green or beige, I should say, or peach or something. Um, but you know, really change the rhythm of the building, the rhythm of the bays, things like that. I mean, it is a confident building. It's a truly varied building. You go back to Forest Street, you go down the block, it kind of pitches back, so there's an odd diagonal intersection. This is the same building. You know, so at the back, it kind of shifts almost to a streamlined, modern thing. This leads, um, it's not open yet, but there's a, a park for the neighborhood that's a children's park, very much designed for kids. The green is a theme that works through. So even if you think this is beguiling or if you think it's overly brash, it's not bland. It's not just a simple box. And 4th Street in Mission Bay where the fire was last year and already that building's already rebuilt, you know, heading toward opening. Um, it's designed as like the kind of neighborhood retail street. Well, in fact, you are having people starting to sign up. Um, Reveille Coffee, we will see again very shortly. But I mean, it, it's the kind of thing that, kind of whatever you think about the architecture, there is the chance that in five or 10 years, Mission Bay will be the kind of place it's a fun place to be. And you'll see kids, you'll see older people along the creek. Um, and so I think it kind of, what it says about today's San Francisco is that the city does have social and architectural aspirations. You know, the social thing, we need class diversity. And then the eternal push and pull, we can get at this in the questions, of architecture that's more than just filling in the blank. And my last building I'm gonna talk about at any real length kind of also bears testimony to aspirations, although it's aspirations of a much different sort. And the ones I'm talking about there, and this is a work in progress, the Trans Bay Terminal, the new Trans Bay Transit Center. Um, if you've been down to First Street, you'll know it doesn't look like this yet, uh, but it is very much under construction. And I think all of you are plugged in enough that you kind of know the parameters of the tale, the idea of consolidating bus and train traffic all at one site, kind of going back to the old Transbay Terminal, but more so bringing up high-speed rail from Los Angeles, bringing cow trains from the peninsula, and while we're at it, adding a beautiful park as the neighborhood center, a rooftop park that'll extend for three blocks, a quarter mile. You know, and this was the winning competition entry, and it was chosen in large part I shouldn't say large part, but definitely in part because of this hook, the rooftop park, that we're not gonna just build a train station, we're going to build a neighborhood center. Um, if, you, if you were my mom and memorized all my stories, you'd know that I did not recommend this team, I recommended a different one. 
Um, however, that's before the High Line opens, so who knows, maybe they'll be right. Um, but, this is how it's supposed to be at the ground. Anyone who remembers what the Transbay Terminal was like knows that this is not how it was at the ground. Um, and so Natoma Street is going to become this pedestrian way, things like that. And one reason it's on, you know, what I'm showing you now are all kind of make-believe visions that we'll start to see in a few years, except the fact is, right now, it is very much under construction. And as someone who's fascinated by changing cities, almost pulling values or judgments out of it, it has really been fascinating the last few years to watch a mind-boggling hole get dug and then watch the hole start to get filled in. This shot is old news. I mean, this, you know, you can kind of see some of the frame down there, but this is way past old news. I mean, since then, it has the, um, structure, you know, the idea is that you've got a very open ground floor that'll have shops and things. Second floor will be like a grand concourse. Um, third floor with the buses on top and then the rooftop. You know, it's already jumped First Street. This photograph's also a few months old. Now it's all the way to Fremont Street. I, I was looking at it today um, and I would guess another week or two, it will jump Fremont Street. You know, it just grows and grows and grows. This is a shot I took from a nearby space, I think last week or the week before. That scoop there is the very middle of the long structure. That's what's called the, golly, they have some goofy name for it. Uh, that I didn't even bother putting on here because it's so goofy. The light column that's going to, essentially it's the skylight, but it's going to pull the light into the space and things like that. And meanwhile, you know, the skin of the building, the panel, this is the, what you're going to see times 5,000. Um, I did the, I did a story about this about six weeks ago that they, Again, the Pelly firm is all about details, and they tested, tested, tested. This is the shimmering alumina with the mica flakes and the angular cuts that is the one they're going to now start churning out by the thousands, and next summer they start getting put on the building. 1917, uh, 19, 2017, boom, it's open, and we'll all be wondering, well, when does the train actually get here? Um, but what's interesting to me is that not only, again, it's an aspirational building, it shows how the San Francisco that we live in, cars are bad, transit is good, the more means of getting around the better. Um, but this is also a project redefining the blocks around it, not just, the, not just almost incidentally, the way that, tran uh, that the Twitter building kind of ignited this dormant area. Here, height limits very consciously were raised to allow for towers to be built on old freeway land that in turn the, the money would be, the money from the land sales and the extra property taxes would be funneled into the Transbay project. So at the same, I don't have images of the, um, what's going to be called the Salesforce Tower, but you know, it's going to have a tower 200 feet, yeah, more than 200 feet taller than the Transamerica Pyramid. But it's also going to have, this building here is 181 Fremont. It will be about 800 feet tall, which is taller than the Bank of America building, not quite as tall as the pyramid. This shot doesn't show it. It will have a direct connection onto the rooftop park the Salesforce Tower will have a direct connection on. Other sites are being done that way. You know, so what you're going to see, you know, you're going to see this thing where these big buildings are going up, totally changing the skyline, driven by the need to fund the thing in the middle, and in turn, folding back into the thing in the middle, which is why I think the park will get done despite all the cost overruns. 
Um, and a lot of these buildings are gonna have a lot of glass. This is a tower that is one of the sites. It is not going to be connected to the park because it's across Beale Street, but it's called Park Tower. And the, you know, it's an office building that starts construction in a month or so. And the marketing, it's like it's gonna be by the beautiful Trans Bay Park and the city's most dynamic new neighborhood, things like that. Now, rather than keep giving this lecture until the Trans Bay Transit Center actually opens in 2017, I wanna shift, so these were five buildings. I wanted, the next five I wanna go through pretty quickly just for kind of points they make and then wrap up and then leave time for questions. So the first one, which is from the book and one of my favorites, is the Embarcadero substation. Uh, I don't know if this is a cult favorite or if you're all wondering why it's up here, but it's down at the corner of Folsom and Fremont Street, just not too far from everything we were just looking at. And it's one of my favorite entries in the book because of the story it tells if you just look at it and figure out the story it tells, which is in the late 60s and early 70s, San Francisco's financial district was growing gangbusters and it needed a lot more power and PG&E had to build a big substation and you're sure not gonna build a big substation near all the cool new towers, so you stick it south of the ramps leading to the Embarcadero Freeway on Rincon Hill, which was pretty much a set of empty warehouse buildings. And you know, you put a big bulky concrete thing there, and who's gonna know? <laughs> but then you have an earthquake, then the Embarcadero Freeway gets torn down, then, um, Rincon Hill gets up zoned to try and create more residential space downtown. And all of a sudden, and this is a shot I took when this was a cityscape column in like 2011. All of a sudden you got these towers a block away. Um, and it's just this fascinating thing that here's this building that shows this is the kind of building that was built for the map of the city that existed in our lifetime but a while ago the city of today has caught up to it, and so there's that incongruity. For the book, the new book that just came out, I reshot this because you've now got buildings going up between the other ones. If you go way back to when I was showing you all the glass towers, I pointed out Lumina, the blue glass ones, those are those. I mean, even this shot's like a year old. Uh, you know, so I had to go back and reshoot it because the city was catching up to it even more. Um, so it's just, it's kind of a fun, and, I, and also I, I grew up in Walnut Creek but spent seven years in Boston. I'm a fan of Boston City Hall, which anyone who knows knows that that means I'll accept anything. And this building makes me feel like I'm back in the heroic Boston of concrete brutalism. Uh, the next, the next structure at a much different scale, and this is actually a Reveille coffee at uh, Kearney and Columbus, but I'm showing it for the parklet. Um, the nice little building in front, and I could, or the structure in front where people can sit. Here's a side view that I know nobody's in it. Um, you know, I could do a whole lecture on parklets and parklet designs, and I could give a whole lecture on people complaining about parklets and parklet designs. Um, I chose this one. I'm just fascinated kind of taking this idea of this ad hoc urbanism, tactical urbanism, bootstrap urbanism, and adapting it to the topography of the city. Um, the reason that this is on here is like a defining structure I mean, the parklet movement's a few years old now, but it continues to spread across. I mean, and I said this in the paper and I'm happy to defend it. I mean, it's almost the most significant thing San Francisco has contributed to the larger world of urban design and planning in the last 15 or 20 years is the notion of grabbing a parking space or two and just creating a little eddy for the pedestrian. Uh, there are now more than 50 of these in the city. And I think another way of looking at the influence and how these things are defining today's landscape 
is they create an acceptance of the idea of the pop-up urbanism, the pop-up retail. And if you think about last week's Dreamforce, which closed a block of Howard between 3rd and 4th Street, I mean, what is this but a parklet? What is it but pop-up urbanism except at a huge publicly traded scale? So the um, seventh, or I'm sorry, that was the seventh. The eighth thing I want to show, I kind of kicked around a lot. The idea is like infill development and infill development in a certain neighborhood. A lot of candidates to choose from, but I selected 8 Octavia, which is at Market and Octavia Boulevard. This shot's probably a year old. It's all done now, but I took this, as you can tell, just walking by, rushing somewhere else, swung up my, my camera, took a shot, and when something turns out that distinctive, when it's shot that haphazardly, it kind of talks about the power of the design. And the architect is Stanley Sadowitz, who's done a number of things around. <coughs> and the reason that I chose his building rather than others that are along the Octavia Boulevard, the former path of the Central Freeway, is that I think it does show this tension in San Francisco, this desire to make San Francisco, at least some neighborhoods, more hospitable you know, to cutting edge architecture, very unusual sculptural architecture. The building opened last winter, but it was actually an outgrowth of a design competition from about 2006 or so in the aftermath of the boulevard of the Central Freeway being torn down. And the idea was to try and create the notion of contemporary design there. And developers were encouraged by the city to work with the architects who were selected for the sites that were in the competition. And when the all-powerful San Francisco Planning Department encourages you to work with Stanley Sadowitz at that site, you figure you've got a better chance of getting that site if he's on your team. So that's how that happened there. Um, not all of those have been built. If you know the proxy development up at Hayes Street, the beer garden, the little pop-up things, um, that's another development site that's been awarded. You know, so they're kind of methodically going through them. But something else that was desired at Octavia Boulevard, and again, this gets into the cultural aspirations. The idea with Octavia Boulevard was to strengthen or preserve or at least create a haven for neighborhood diversity to the extent possible. So no fewer than 50% of the housing units that are being created on the surplus land must be for lower income residents. This building I think has a few inclusionary units, but if I hadn't have gone with 8 Octavia, I could have gone with the Richardson Apartments at Fulton and Goff, I hope. Uh, by David Baker, not the one with the dome, but the one to the <laughs> right. And this is how it looks there. You know, you turn the corner and, I mean, again, this is ex doesn't look anything like Sadowitz's work, but it's the same very aggressive, assertive, contemporary look, you know, kind of play around, but with a real attention to the ground floor. Again, part of the what's kicking and cooking kicking around and cooking in today's San Francisco is the idea that what really counts is how the building engages the ground, how it engages the pedestrians, things like that. Uh, my next building, it is the one kind of um, almost interior. It's Sight Glass Coffee on 7th Street near Folsom Street. And this is what it looks from, like from the outside, very nondescript. Um, what's of interest is how this old, like kind of garage type building, and you can tell, you know, if you, if you pay attention to architecture, you know that the lower glass work is very new. But, um, you know, the inside is this real kind of rough hewn yet rarefied wonder. Um, it is the kind of place where you spend way too much for coffee, and that shot I took just 
you know, pretty casually, is from the mezzanine. So essentially, it's just, you know, reach in, take out, leave the rough elements that are there, and just create this space that you're really aware, you know, they, they're roasting the coffee in there, they're mixing it, they're shipping it off. And it is very much kind of, you know, when I, I wrote about this in 2012, that long ago time, and I, you know, talked about how a blue collar shell has been fine tuned with 21st century pride. And, you know, I, I was kind of impressed that yesterday's city was repurposed to enrich tomorrow's potential. Which is not a line in the book. This didn't make the book. Uh, it hasn't been a cityscape. See, you, you, get, you get stuff that's never anywhere else. Um, so again, on the one hand, this is a few years old. On the other hand, this is the Twitter building. This is all the reclaimed wood bars you see and everything. I mean, this building kind of was capturing that moment that, look at this, we can kind of create small batch special urban things and we can all kind of be like that. And it's a funny little building because the coffee's too expensive, but it's good. You know, the beards are precious, but if I was 27 years old, I'd probably try to have a beard like that. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. It's like you can really see, I, a, a friend of mine said it, it's the one place where he saw someone wearing Google Glass without an ironic thing going on. He was just <laughs> sitting, you know, so, but it's an interesting thing because it is, it is the city. And, it, and it's like the idea of Google Glass in this kind of really rough-hewn wooden setting I mean, that is some of the tension of San Francisco today. We want it to be very artisanal and we want it to be extremely of the moment. Um, the last one, and this is partly plain to the host and also returning to the book, um, I just want to end with a building that was born of the exposition that's all around us shoved against the walls and that is the Palace of Fine Arts, which I don't need to fill in for you. That's, you know, I'm willing to belabor the ferry building, but you, you, you kind of know the story of the Palace of the Fine Arts. So why put it into this talk? And partly because of something we've looked at, just how the city of today venerates the city of long ago. Because not only do tourists go there to take photographs for the modified melancholy of Bernard Maybeck, you know, it, it's a place that locals go to, but it's also interesting to me because it shows how in San Francisco the past is not always what it seems. You know, it, our history is an act of invention. And this is a building, I'm sure you all know the history, it was built, it was going to be torn down, it was kept because people fell in love with it. Come the 60s it was falling apart, it was essentially paper mache. So it was kind of torn down and rebuilt. Ada Louise Huxtable in the New York Times scoffed at it, which shows that even Ada Louise Huxtable could be wrong. Just as Alan Timko's first architecture piece for the Chronicle in the early 60s was on a look at Market Street. And at the end, he just kind of mentioned cavalierly that the ferry building needed to be torn down to open up the view of the bay. Um, but you know, so this is essentially a 1960s construct that was a rebuilding of a 1915 vision that has now been redone. It wasn't rebuilt a few years ago, but it was seismically strengthened. So there was a lot of work put into it a few years ago. So it's, you know, San Francisco is a city that treasures its past Often the past it treasures is a past that's been, be, been rebuilt one or two or three times. But who cares, you know? It's a gorgeous, mesmerizing thing. And so I just want to finish the, the organized part of the talk there and then go to questions. But, you know, these are 10 very different structures. And my hope is that they give a sense of the range of experiences and spaces that make today's San Francisco so distinct a city and so memorable despite the tensions and the imperfections and all the strains that we can feel from day to day. So I just want to say thanks and then open the floor to questions.
And the sun hasn't completely gone down, so I didn't go on too long. Um, any, any questions or? Oh, yes. I'm struck by some of the buildings you show, the, the lower residential buildings, not the high house, seem to me very reminiscent of European cities. I think that's true. I mean, it, it, um, you look at the more contemporary things. Europe is a, European cities have been much more comfortable with the idea of old and new kind of going at it like that. San Francisco, I think, from the 70s into the 90s was much more of a kind of everything needs to be overtly gestural or contextual toward the history that preceded it. And so I think there was a lot more of that type of thing going on. And now in certain neighborhoods, there's an openness to being more adventurous. I think you're right. It's, um, on the steps in the green. In, in the 1184th Street Green. <laughs> um, when I see these new buildings going on with all their glass, I worry about the size of the city. How do you know those windows are not as well? Yeah, the question is, what happens in the big earthquake? Do all of the glass buildings not be something you want to be near? Actually, I, it's funny, I wrote about that in the last boom, because that was such an issue. I should probably just dust the piece off and rerun it. Um, the glass buildings are all curtain walls, which means they are big panels that are pre-assembled. So you're not putting the piece of glass in, you're putting in the panel that includes the metal framing it, the spandrel, everything, snapped into place. Lots of testing goes on, you know, in wind tunnels and things. So if it twisted and turned, it would still stay locked in. If it fell, the whole thing would fall. You wouldn't have glass shatter out. Obviously, you don't want to be under a panel falling, but it won't fall. Um, but if the glass comes out, however it does, it is like a car window. It's the little round things rather than shards. So, yes. On the corner of the same subject, it's very difficult, although as you rightly say, possible to design large glass buildings in the earthquake zone, where the here in Santiago, Chile, may work. Mm -hmm. During the five, six day mission, it seems to me it'd be a very timid attempt to deal with those problems. It looks like the uh, steel framework in which someone's put a fair amount of glass it looks more like a police barracks than a large, large nice building. Are you sure that this is a promise, not a threat? Yeah, you know, I thought it was a threat until the lights came on, and then I thought it was a promise. I mean, it, again, it's, architecture is a very subjective thing. Um, he was kind of saying that 560 uh, mission seems like a very timid thing. I actually, I, I like the texture of it, but what do I know? I'm a history major who is an ink-stained journalism wretch. So uh, uh, way at the back and then over here. What do you mean, supposedly, the first street curtain wall building in the U.S.? Uh, this is about Halliday Building. Why did I say supposedly? Because there is a subset of architectural historians who speaks up for a Kansas City building as having been that. The proponents of the Halliday Building, who include Kenneth Frampton, who kind of trumps everyone in that field, say, but the... Kansas City building was more pieces of it, and the Halliday building was the first clean glass drape. So, but I say supposedly because if you were from Kansas City, you would have raised your hand and said, what about the whatever it is in Kansas City? Uh, yeah. You wanted to tell us about the Lucas Museum. Um, do I want to tell you about the Lucas Museum? It is in Chicago. I... I am not a science fiction buff or a fantasy buff, which means I am a total agnostic on the value of the collection, um, but I didn't think the building was right for the site, and George Lucas wasn't interested in working with the Presidio Trust. And the trust had some reservations, but I think if they had been courted a bit, they would have been more open to it. But it, it's a long story, believe me. 
Any other questions? Yes. Down to something very uh, more mundane, but um, uh, a lovely piece of history. You showed the block on Folsom that has the blacksmith shop. Yes. And every time I go by there, which isn't often enough, I was like, is it still there? What do you know about that? The last time I went by, it was still there, but I was thinking I need to call and see if it's gonna, I mean, it's, a, it's a historic landmark. I mean, that building's going to stay. The question is, does an operating blacksmith stay in it? You know, it's, it's a guy clocker who's been there forever, so I don't know. I, sh I should check on that. So, uh, yes. A place like South Park stay and have its ambiance and little two-story. Uh, the question is, can a place like South Park stay and have its ambiance? Yes. Um, that is extraordinarily valuable real estate at this point, and it is extraordinarily valuable for that ambiance. Very tight zoning. The last building sale, I think, there was to a venture capital fund. I mean, the question can be, what is the ambiance? But South Park is not going anywhere. So there was a hand. Yes. Right. Well, this is kind of a general question or maybe a dangerous one about the Historic Preservation Commission. Mm -hmm. and uh, formerly the Landmark uh, Commission, and we are, I'm on it, a oh. fairly new member, yeah. and um, I don't know you. I'm, hi, I'm Ellen, Ellen Junk, um, and happy to talk with you more. Anyway, uh, we are really, I'm an archaeologist on the commission, the preservation planner slot uh, amongst the architects, and um, the goal, what we're really trying to do is beyond landmarks, we're trying to uh, do our uh, approvals of um, changes to buildings and, and landmarking, looking at the story, more of your theme, the people and the natural landscape, the place in which it sits, documenting more of those resource attributes of a building. And um, uh, we're just trying to do a better job on that. And I, I just was wondering uh, how you think we're doing. And if um. Yeah, the, the question from a preservation member of the Historic Preservation Commission is how do you define landmarks and how do you go beyond pure architectural landmarks and how are they doing? If um, I had a lot more space in the Chronicle, I'd do a large essay on that. Because I think that preservation is so fascinating right now and I think it, um, one, of the, one of the buildings in the book is the Marquard Little Cigar Shop or whatever on Powell Street, the great neon sign, which when I heard it was closing, I put something in the paper, boy, I sure hope the sign doesn't go anywhere. Planners, we're not gonna let that sign go anywhere. So now we have this really great atmospheric noir neon sign over a franchised hat store. And it looks extremely incongruous, and it's kind of great it's there, but it also is a weird gesture that's uh, not quite as ludicrous as the milk farm sign that's on Interstate 80 to Sacramento, where, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area, so I know why it was saved. But 20 or 40 years from now, people are going to go, what's with the cow over by the Walmart sign? So, so it's tr anyway, the point is it's tricky because the cultural thing, a lot of it is someone earnestly saying, this is a building of our culture and it, is res it, it shows our culture and we have to save our culture. Um, and how can you be against that? But if it's like, kind of like, this is where the first sorry game was ever played in the Western United States, and you have to save this building because it is a seminal location in the history of board games. It's like, well, that's true for 18 people, but, you know, so I mean, it, in other words, I think it's a great direction to go, but it's such a tricky direction to go. So I, I, I need to write more about it, but it's, it's really fascinating. Um, yes, and then over here. Yes. Yeah, I'm very curious about uh, some of the tall buildings and the proposal on the structure and the high controversial. I missed the tall building part. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do you have any thoughts about the tall buildings that have been proposed at Lonely and Barton Barrow that have been quite controversial? Uh, like Abe Washington and 75 Howard. Uh, that it seems to me that the, the opposition should be grounded 
in the original opposition to the Fontana Towers in the 1960s, mm -hmm. which is, to me, it looks like a completely different environment. It's caused the same sort of controversy. Yeah, the question is kind of tall buildings on the waterfront. Um, it gets a little into the emotional thing. How can you want a wall on the waterfront? And, and someone could say, well, you know, when you actually look at it, we're talking about a 20-story building with a 20-story building on either side in the financial district. But the answer is, oh, so you want a wall on the waterfront. And then you say, well, no, I don't. <laughs> I take it back. And it, it's, it's, it's tricky. San Francisco is such an emotional city tenaciously and it and it gets I mean I if eight Washington had popped up magically overnight I don't think people really would have noticed it or thought much about it but the idea of filling this thing in was a very easy thing to rally around um, 75 Howard's kind of a different otter story um, essentially a developer in New York found out that in the stuff they inherited in some purchase of a bankrupt REIT's assets or something was a parking garage in San Francisco on Howard Street. So they said, wow, and it's on the waterfront. So it's like, here's a 300-foot building, and it didn't get anywhere. So it kind of kept shrinking, and now it's within the zoning. But the real diehard waterfront tower opponents are saying it's a wall on the waterfront. You know, so it's, we'll see where it goes. But it's, it gets into the historic preservation. It's how do you fight emotion? And sometimes you side with the emotion. It's tricky. Um, there was someone, that's it, right there, and then back to you. You, said, you mentioned something about what some of the new buildings say about our, our culture. I'm sort of curious how you feel about all of those identical tall glass towers going up within a six block radius of each other and what in 20 years that will say about our culture. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of touched on that in the talk, but it's, I don't know how, I don't know that it'll age that well. Um, and I know that the planning department has had some second thoughts about allowing them and doesn't really, like I showed you the, um, the shot of Park Tower by Transbay. It's actually a project that didn't go through planning. It went through the the redevelopment or what what redevelopment is now um, the planning department back around 2008 or 9 said no more all glass towers we're getting out of this is getting a little out of hand however a lot of towers that were approved in the last recession didn't start construction until the current boom so you have this kind of odd well i mean my my concern I have no problem with modern architecture. Again, 560 Mission, with all deference, I think is a great building. Most of the stuff just has such a slick two-dimensional feel that I don't think it fits well into the texture of the city. It's very difficult to do buildings like that that fit the ground. And then also, um, a lot of them don't really feel like they have that much interest in fitting into things around them. They're more about drawing attention. So I think that, the, you know, the problem is is that you have trends. And I think that the cluster, I think there's a good chance it will create kind of a neat neighborhood. I think the cluster could get, look pretty old and dated. Um, but it's tricky if you build a bunch of buildings this high and some of them aren't that good, who knows about it? But if you, <laughs> you build some of those bigger ones. But it, so I, I guess I'm saying I personally wish there was a bit more masonry and a bit, I'm not a postmodernist, but I think some of the underlying principles of the plans in the 80s and 90s to sculpt the buildings more was a good one. You know, it, trends just go back and forth. It's very odd. And there, oh, okay, back there and then back there and then see if, yes. So you mentioned uh, parklets and there you seem to say that there was a lot of positives, a lot of negative releases when I talk about it. What do you think about it? Does that have a future? Oh, I, I think parklets are great. I think there is a, uh, the question was, do parklets have a future? I think parklets are really a neat trend. I think that they are way oversold by their proponents. Um, one of the real tension, 
I'm not talking gentrification here. <laughs> I'm talking tensions from a fine grain urban design standpoint. Um, almost what you might call hipster urbanism of kind of de defining a city for really fun people who are 24 and are drinking coffee and hanging out. And you know, I, I personally, I, I, I really like the parklets as like a little place to take a break and sit but I don't think that there's something to be mass replicated. So it's just, a, it, I like them, but I don't think that they, I don't think that a cool parklet is a substitute for a good park with play equipment for children. We'll put it that way. But there's no reason a city can't have both. And I think we should probably about wrap up, so maybe one last question and then I will be signing books. You can talk to me then. Uh, yes. How do you feel about uh, the Mission Rock uh, proposal? How do I feel about the Mission Rock proposal? Well, with the neighborhood, make a neighborhood. Uh, the question is, how do I feel about the Giants Mission Rock proposal, the parking lots south of the ballpark that are on the ballot this fall? I need to look at it. I mean. I, th I, don't, I think it'll work as an extension of Mission Bay. It, it's kind of just a site plan that has to go to the voters, but what do I know? Except I talk a lot. That's what I know. I talk <laughs> well, I think we would concur that he knows a lot. Thank you, John. And we have, we have boxes of John's books, and we're going to rearrange the front a bit and let him have a sip of wine, and he'll sign books. Also, please take a look at the light installation behind us by award-winning artist Ben Woods. It's the fourth of our six installations called Engineers of Illumination, where we're commissioned original light-based artworks to commemorate, problematize, uh, and help us understand the 1915 World's Fair's legacies. This one is uh, on Ishii, appropriately. And it's called Lopa Picta, or Rope Picture. So enjoy it. Uh, Carl Nolte wrote about it a few weeks ago. If you haven't seen it, it's a real treat, inside and outside. It's both. So again, thank you so much for coming. Uh, enjoy, uh, think deeply, and act historically. <laughs>